Conviction is brought to you by Three Rings Circus Productions. For links to our valued sponsors and all the show notes from this podcast, please visit our website, threeringscircus.com.au. Welcome to Series 2 of Conviction, the Craig Guse story. If you've recently discovered this podcast, we encourage you to listen to Series 1, available on most streaming platforms. Series 1, consisting of eight episodes, introduces you to the three dimensions of Craig's life, his undercover police work, his family and their support of eldest daughter Jessica as she battles a rare cancer, and finally, Craig's preparation for an extreme marathon in order to raise money to support children with cancer. To say there was a lot going on in Craig's life is an understatement, and it's all available in Series 1. We start Episode 9, the first instalment of Series 2, as Craig is about to commence his epic 1,000-kilometre open water paddle, an excruciating journey that begins in Avalon Beach, New South Wales, and ends in Broad Beach, Queensland, the equivalent of paddling solo from San Francisco to San Diego, almost the entire Californian coastline. Oh, and did I mention sharks? I might be getting ahead of myself. With Jessica in the final stages of her cancer treatment and Project Gymea busy filing the paperwork on their successful arrest of underworld figure Les Kalachi, the time was right to focus on the ultra marathon. Let's begin as Craig contemplates the countdown to day one. I'd intensified the training because it was within two months that I was leaving. This this dream of doing this marathon had, had soon become a reality. You, you know, you're soon not questioning yourself, but you're starting to think, have I done enough? Uh, can I do this? Is my body in a position to be able to do a 16-day marathon that really I'd never done anything like before? My body's already under stress from the work and from the family life that we'd been doing and could it cope? And I suppose it was only a matter of time and, and until I told the story. I can remember coming up to the uh, the final days leading into the, the marathon and we still I still didn't have a ski. I, I was going to have to paddle this old ski. And luckily dolphin skis, which uh, at the time and still are to this date, one of the most popular surf ski um, around Australia that's com- they compete on. They came forward and uh, decided to donate a brand new ski for me, and uh, I still hadn't received it within you know two weeks of leaving, and I was getting a bit worried because every ski is different. You ride anyway. The day had finally come to getting ready to go, and we had our last meeting. I got my ski probably about two days before, and I managed to get one training session on it it didn't feel too bad it still worried me I still wasn't a confident uh, competitive paddler and I was thinking on the day that I had to leave if the swell is going to be big this is going to be embarrassing trying to get this thing out Um, Channel 9 had come on board as well the Channel 9 wild world of sports had taken interest in it because I was actually going to be the first person to ride a single surf ski from Sydney to Queensland one other guy had done it before. He'd done it from Queensland down to Sydney. He'd paddled down the coast before with the nor'easters and with the current, but no one had actually done it again. So Channel 9 took an interest and we got the Australian Surf Life Saving also interested. It was a great PR thing for them. So they got me to carry the gold medal for the Open Surf Ski Championship. So when I arrived up at Currawa Beach or Broad Beach, I was actually carrying the gold medal, which would be presented to the winner of the Open Ski Paddle on the day that I arrived. So I was going to arrive five minutes after the final. Craig had started his own charity, which was cleverly called A to B for C. Avalon to Broadbeach for cancer. Although, as we will discover in subsequent series, sticking to this acronym for other ultramarathons had its built-in challenges. Finding a starting point that commenced with A and a finish point beginning with B would take him across the entire continent of Australia, but we will leave that for another episode. The kids were so excited, I must admit. 
the night before, I can remember uh, having dinner and putting the kids to bed and they all had their A to B for C shirts there on the end of the bed and their gear ready to go. Lisa and I had a nice meal and a, a sit down and a talk and I was going to be away for the, the 16 days and Jessica had one last lot of treatment to go. It was only a short three-day chemotherapy treatment while I was away, which was great, and that was her last of the, the 12 months. Craig had assembled a fantastic support crew consisting of family and local lifesavers and he was equipped with a brand new surf ski. The day had arrived. Uh, Lisa and I, you know, went to bed and I can remember waking up at least six to seven times during the night, just my nerves. I was, uh, kept thought, I heard wind and rain and everything else. All these things go through your mind because they're going to be nuisances when you have to paddle. But uh, sure enough, I woke up, it was a brilliant morning. I woke up very early and got the kids ready. They were well and truly up, ready to go. And we headed off down to uh, Avalon Beach where I was going to start. Everything was down there. I just had to turn up. I remember getting probably about 100 metres from the house and uh, I had to stop the car, flung open the door and I vomited everywhere. And I'm sure it was just nerves. I was really, really nervous. The nervous thing was just getting off the beach. I just wanted to get the first five minutes out and done and away. I arrived down the beach and everyone was there waiting. We had a huge support because the school was involved and you know I've been living in this area for now for 50 something years but by that stage I think I was 36. I'd been there all my life and had a great um, number of friends and followers who were all behind me and they turned up. There was a couple of hundred people with obviously Channel 9 and it was something that you sort of um, don't get used to and I took off from the beach that morning and all I, can, all I could think of was I'm going to fall off this bloody ski. And probably the most important thing or the most memorable part was just before I was about to enter the water, Jessica came running down and gave me a big kiss and wished me luck. And it really meant a lot. And uh, yeah, just before I headed off, that was, that was the last thing I remember. Day one consisted of a 55 kilometre paddle to the entrance. The entrance takes its name from the narrow channel which connects Tugra Lake to the ocean. It is a popular holiday destination with only a few thousand local residents. Managed to get out unscathed, which I was worried about so much, and uh, out, out the back was a flotilla of police boats. I had three police boats, and then there was probably about another eight local guys who had boats, and they were going to follow me up to Terrigal, for, which those who don't know is probably about a 20 kilometre, 25 kilometre paddle up the coast. It was a great morning. It wasn't ideal. It was um, still a little breeze blowing in, a bit of a chop, but it was good to get my sea legs in for the first day. I got off uh, the coast of the central coast and a couple of lifeguards who had heard about it on, on the radio had come out and visit me, uh, wished me luck. Uh, to their humour, one of them stuck a picture of a shark on the front of my ski in a sticker uh, and I said, I'm sure I'm going to come across a few of those and that happened within the, probably the next two k's. A hammerhead came up near me and disappeared just as quick. Didn't really worry me. I pretty much focused on getting to that first spot, which was Terrigal. Yeah, I made that there, and the flotilla of the crafts hung around until I had morning tea there, and then uh, they headed back towards Sydney. I was pretty happy at this stage because I was in a zone then. I was by myself. I paddled down probably another 30 or 40 k's, and bunkered in for the night. We were staying in surf clubs and every night we virtually had a uh, fundraising event and uh, I stayed at the surf club at the entrance, I think it was, or down the very end of the central coast. Did a talk that night, um, got back onto the ski at, in the early hours of the morning and started heading towards Newcastle. That was my next destination, which is quite a big city uh, north of Sydney. Day two, 55 kilometres, the entrance to Newcastle Harbour. Newcastle is the second largest city in New South Wales and the largest coal exporting port in the entire world. Despite its industrial imagery, it actually has some of the state's most beautiful beaches. And at the time, Craig was making this journey more live music venues than any city in Australia. Sadly, they were off limits for Craig on this trip. Really nice conditions, the first part. And I had blisters that still just came on my hands already. I'd been training a lot 
and the only thing is I you know I might train for the longest period four hours but when you're on the ski for six to nine hours a day that changes things it's like running I suppose if you keep running and running and running you get blisters on your feet and the same with my hands I started to develop these massive blisters on my hands and by the time I got down to near Swansea Belmont where I had lunch I was joined by two Ironmen from that club and uh, they were saying, you know, you can put metho on your hands, you can pee on your hands, you can do anything. But the sad fact was I had blisters that had already started to pop and there was no getting rid of them. So it was just a matter of uh, putting up with it. I managed to get down to Newcastle Harbour that afternoon and, and stayed there the night. We had accommodation in the surf club down there at Newcastle. Day three, Newcastle Harbour to Fingal Bay, 50 kilometres. Fingal Bay is another picturesque holiday town on the New South Wales north coast. There is a large island off its shores, which most disturbingly is named Shark Island. And probably the next day I woke up pre-dawn and I paddled out of the harbour. I remember coming out of the harbour and it was magical. It was one of these beautiful mornings. And for those who you know aren't familiar with the water, it's just one of those magical things when you get out in the sea, and especially for me who've grown up on the beach all my life and, and been around water all my life. I suppose if you're talking to someone who came from Switzerland in the mountains, it's like being up on the top of the Alps and you're looking down on a perfect day when the snow's there and everything else. Being out in the water to me was just the most fascinating place in the world. And the things that are out there and the things that you see, or sometimes things you don't see, it's just that feeling when there's no wind, the swell rolling through and the sun's coming up on the horizon. And that's what it was like this morning coming out of the harbour. It was fascinating. I had a long paddle ahead. I had the whole Stockton Bight. The Stockton Bight is a long stretch of beach. Um, and for people who are in boats, they know what it's like. It's a very rough section of the coast where big swell comes onto shallow banks and knocks boats around a fair bit. It's also renowned for its sharks. Everyone says there's always sharks across the Stockton Bight. And a lot of the reason is, is there's massive schools, especially this time of the year, of mullet that come through and they come along this long stretch of beach and the sharks follow these big schools. I was paddling out, I was probably about four or five k's out off the coast. And during the time we did have a, a um, surf life saving rubber ducky that followed me the whole way. They were videoing the trip, uh, not only there for the videoing but also there for the safety fact. And um, I, they didn't stay with me the whole time. Sometimes I'd be fishing or sometimes I'd be out looking at something else. But I saw a, you know, a heap of splashing in front of me and I was intrigued. It was obviously a massive school of fish. So I went through this massive school of fish and sure enough, it just fish everywhere. And uh, next thing I felt this whack on the, on the front of my ski. And I thought it was actually a, a fish at first, but what it was was actually a shark chasing the fish. Um, they weren't massive sharks, these ones out there. They were just, I don't know, five, six foot. But they were in amongst all the fish chasing them. And as long as the fish were there, I was quite happy. Paddled a long way up through the, the beach until it got to lunchtime. And I was, I'd was i done the better stage of the day. And I thought it's going to be an early day. I got off the uh, the ski and just paddled into where the, the sand was. It was going to be a day of just the support crew from the, in the boat. There was no land crew with me and um, they had my lunch while I was having lunch one of the guys said oh, I might go for a p paddle on your ski I'd rode with Daryl all my life and he was another water man and loved the ocean he got on my ski and went for a paddle and he was back within about two minutes and I said what's the matter he said I got about 50 meters off the the shore and a dirty big shark just went straight under my ski and he said that's it and I'm not going out again I took off that afternoon and I noticed that the wind had started and Typically in the afternoon we get a nor'easter. The nor'easters blow and when they blow they, they come in hard. And for me, paddling a surf ski, if it's really good conditions, a lot of your energy is you know just on gliding the ski along and you're going at it maybe between 10 and 13 kilometres an hour. Uh, and it's quite comfortable. When it starts getting rough, you're using a lot of your energy to balance the ski. It also obviously slows down. If you're in a headwind, it slows the ski down tremendously. Again, it's like a cyclist going into the breeze or the same thing if you've got a, an ultra marathon runner and he goes from running on the road to doing off-road running. Just that constant going sideways rather than forward all the time 
you know, dodging rocks and things like that. It's the same same principle. So when the wind gets up, you lose so much of your rhythm and you lose so much of your energy. And this is what happened on this particular day. It was the first real test of toughness. And I think I had about 10 to 15 k's to go, uh, which I thought I'd finish within about an hour and 20. And it took me about three hours. I not only had the nor'easter and the swell, I had uh, rocks, headlands to go around at the very end of Stockton Beach until I got to a place called Fingal Bay. And there was one point there where I just stopped paddling. My hands with the blisters were aching. I put my legs over and I was starting to get dragged backwards at a greater knots and you know, just sitting still. And I couldn't sit there, I had to keep paddling. I got to Fingal Bay that afternoon, I was wrecked. It was probably the first time I'd really felt this way. I got off my ski and I just went into the surf club and sat in the showers and sat down with the cold water running over me feeling sorry for myself and the first thing I thought of was you know poor old Jess and how these kids felt in the hospital and of course they would have just picked themselves up and got back on with playing games or doing something and that's exactly what I thought I had to do I couldn't sit there feeling sorry for myself I had to get in get up get changed and uh, start to recover and get a massage I went into the surf club where we were staying and there was a bit of a commotion in there. I thought, what the bloody hell's happening in here? The boys were all uh, standing around and what had happened was a big brown snake had come out of the sand dunes near the surf club and came into the club. The eastern brown snake, often referred to as the common brown snake, is a species of highly venomous snake native to eastern and central Australia and southern New Guinea. And the local caretaker unfortunately had to kill the snake um, before it got into any of the gear in the club and the commotion was was one of the boys had got the dead snake and put it in one of the other guy's sleeping bags for the night uh, <laughs> and he'd found it prior to getting into bed and just about crapped himself and these are the antics i suppose of the support crew how they entertain themselves it was quite funny some of the uh, the jokes that took place during the trip Day four was another 70-kilometre journey north to Seal Rocks. Forget the dead brown snake in the sleeping bag. Place names like Shark Island and Seal Rocks would be more worrying to most of us. For those who don't know, this area, Port Stephens, is really well known for its game fishing. The next morning I headed off from Fingal Bay and I probably headed out into the deepest waters that I've ever been in off Port Stephens. It's a massive area where um, they catch huge amount of shark and sport fish because of the depth of the water and virtually leaving Fingal Bay I can remember paddling within about two kilometres and the water changed from being how it normally is to this crystal deep blue like you see when you go out into deep ocean and I uh, was paddling all of a sudden and I noticed this thing under me and I couldn't work out what it was and I'd come up on these reefs that were out in the middle of nowhere I didn't have a, a GPS or a a depth sounder with me. I was just on a single ski with two tubes going to some liquids that I used to feed off. Um, and that was it, I was on my own. And it's a weird sight when you go from all of a sudden this deep blue ocean to seeing something when you're a couple of k's out off the coast. And what it was was reef. I'd go over, come over these reefs. It was the most weirdest feeling and it took me about 30 seconds to a minute to actually adjust to what it was again very unique again it wasn't long before the nor'easters popped up again it was probably around 11 in the morning and it was just getting intense and intense and intense and i thought i'll go further into the into the coast to see if i can get out of it because the further you get out the more exposed you are to the wind uh, the more exposed you are to the um, east coast current of australia so i thought I'll, I'll get right in and i got in as close as i could but Again, it just got uglier and uglier and I decided to pull my ski in to the beach and have a rest and have some lunch. And then I realised on the other side of the sand dunes was an, uh, a lake system that ran pretty much parallel down. It was a little bit longer. So I, I threw the ski in the lake and paddled in nice still water all the way down to where I could put the ski back in closer to seal rocks. It probably added an extra an hour and a half onto the paddle, but I didn't have that arduous task of paddling in this nor'easter with the balance and everything else. It was a long day, it was a nine hour day that day and uh, it certainly took its toll on my body. I was lucky that uh, Bluey's Beach Resort took me in that night and this is day four mind you uh, and they'd also organised a local uh, 
masseuse to come up and, and give me a really good going over because my body was pretty worked by this stage. And again, remember this is my first ever <laughs> go at having a crack at a marathon. So day four, um, pretty well worn out, the hands are shot, the back's pretty bent, pretty sore. I can remember lying in Bluey's Beach Hotel and all of a sudden a whole group of people came in. And unbeknownst to me, it was Lisa, my wife's brother, with his kids and my son Tim. They decided to come camping up the coast at Foster and uh, decided to pop their head in and visit me and give me a bit of inspiration and uh, pump up. So to get a cuddle and a kiss from my, uh, my young boy Tim... And to see all the rest of them was great. It was a great boost for me at that time when I was feeling at my lowest point. Day five, Bluey's Beach, Seal Rocks to Crowdy Head, a gruelling 65 kilometres. I went from uh, Bluey's Beach, paddled down to Foster that next day. I can remember coming near the Foster break wall and, and seeing another shark. I'd seen a couple of, of small sharks during this time. Had a great paddle all the way through up the coast to um, Kangaroo Point. Had some lunch there. And then from Kangaroo Point, it was ugly again. It was a massive nor'easter. Paddle what I could. My destination was Crowdy Point. And I got within about 5Ks of Crowdy Point. And I pulled in and gave my ski to one of the support crew who took it. And I ended up running the last 5Ks on the soft sand. I um, wrapped a towel around my face because the sand was actually like just blowing up it was like sandpaper that's how much it was blowing and you're sort of leaning really forward if anyone has been in those conditions when the wind's blowing that strong that's how hard it was when paddling that when you're running you felt it but I got to Crowdy Head and um, finished the day again pretty shot but I had a fundraiser on that night with Camp Quality they'd come down to do a fundraiser with us and that was one of the groups that we were raising money for they'd put in a big um, a big meal for the crew and myself I can remember going out to um, see what the conditions were like that night at the end of the fundraiser and one of the guys who was on the support crew came running back in. He'd just been speaking to his wife and he came running back in and said, come and have a look at this. I went outside and here's this dirty big snake. It was a diamond head python and uh, it had grabbed a possum in the tree and was just about to drop down to the ground. It grabbed the possum and it uh, constricted it so it was actually crushing it and suffocating it and it dropped to the ground and then it started to eat the thing whole and we watched for 45 minutes as this diamond head python ate this massive possum whole it was the most amazing sight i've never seen it before i'd never seen anything like it it was quite amazing how the, the snake was breaking or cracking its jaw and opening up to a point where it was probably uh demolishing this possum which was the, the size of a medium-sized dog or small dog on day six, the journey is becoming more arduous as Craig battles the elements a further 65 kilometres north to Port Macquarie. It's worth pointing out that Craig is continually paddling against the prevailing current. And that is hard enough, but when the wind is blowing in the same direction, well, it's like trying to walk up an escalator the wrong way. The next day was, again, extremely, extremely ugly and not even the trawlers were leaving Crowdy Head. They called it a black nor'easter where the currents are running really, really strong and uh, the wind's that strong, it's so ugly. I decided to ditch the ski and, and try and run it. Because I had fundraisers every single place that I went to, I, I couldn't stop. So I decided to run 65 kilometres from Crowdy Head to... Port Macquarie. I think it's 79 or 80 kilometres by road and about 65 by headland and, and beach. And that was going to be a massive day. Again, it did give my hands a break. My hands were pretty shot. They were starting to, to callous up, but they're still pretty shot. I'd never done 65 kilometres in soft sand. And again, it was just another one foot in front of the other. Day seven, Port Macquarie to Crescent Head. By Craig's standards, this was a simple 45 k's on this trip. He had some visitors, some expected, others not. The next day I left Port Macquarie and had to get to Crescent Head. I paddled out the first hour, I think it was, and maybe two hours, and I'd been told that the water police were going to come and visit me. So it must have been about eight in the morning. 
I was probably about five to six k's out off the coast and I decided to um, stop. I wanted something to eat, so the easiest way was to stop, just throw your, your legs over the side of the ski and to eat. It's a bit hard when you're just trying to eat things with your legs up because the balance. So having my le- feet over into the water was a lot easier. And at this time, the water police had radioed our guys and said they're coming to see me. I could see them heading our way. And they pulled up right next to me and they said, what are you doing? And I said, what do you mean? They said, sitting there with your legs dangling over you like bait. And I said, it's the only way I can really eat apart from getting off the ski and getting in the support crew boat. It's the easiest way. And they said, we had a 17-foot hammerhead caught off here last week by a local fisherman. Right where you're sitting. I said, you're joking. They said, no. Anyway, my feet were soon up, I tell you. I was hanging onto the side of the uh, support crew eating my morning tea rather than dangling my feet over. They just shook their head and thought I was mad. But anyway, gave me the respect and uh, and chuffed off. And without a lie, within about uh, two kilometres of paddling from there, I was paddling along and I was really on a mission this particular day. My body started to feel a little bit better. My hands weren't as sore. And I was on a mission to get to the next point, which would have been lunch destination. I can't remember exactly where it was. But unbeknownst to me, a shark had popped up about 20 metres behind me and the support crew were probably about 50 metres away and they saw it. They saw the fin slowly coming up. It kept rising, kept rising, kept rising. And these guys didn't know the size of it. They thought it's going to be a bloody big shark, this one, the way that the fin kept coming out of the water. The guy who was in the observation position was standing at the front of the boat and that was a bit of a telltale sign that I said to them, if there's ever anything around me, stand at the front of the boat and I'll get an idea and you can point. The only problem was I was in front of them, they were behind me. I had no idea, I had my head down, bum up, paddling my guts out. Anyway, they didn't yell out, didn't do anything, they just came up. The shark got to within about two metres of the ski and then just disappeared under me again and without me knowing, that's how close it came. I had no idea where it went. They had no idea where it went, but they came in very close just in case it got under me and was going to come back and knock me off. Because generally that's what the sharks would do. They'd come from behind. They're a predator and they'll come uh, up from behind and then knock you off. I didn't see it. I didn't know, so it was no no deal to me. And You sort of just wonder how many times this does happen. That particular day as well, I'd um, just about finished the day at Crescent Head. I could see my destination and up in front I saw another large object in the water I thought geez that's unusual it's a different shape it's not moving too much I wonder what it is so it looked like a boy anyway as I paddled up to it I realized it was a dirty big sea turtle it was massive it was probably about a good meter in diameter obviously an old fella it had like barnacles on the the back of the shell and it looked like it must have been dead anyway because I'm on a ski I'm not, not making any noise I'm just gliding through the water with my paddle I got very close and it soon realized that something was behind it being me (laughs) it couldn't move quick enough it tried to dive down and as it dove down it just let this big feces out the rear end that sprayed everywhere it just about hit me disappeared and I was just laughing to myself how funny that was and the poor thing was probably like me if a shark was behind me paddled into Crescent Head and uh, there was some media waiting I remember this particular day and I thought I could see the, the crew would message the support crew to tell me that the media were there and I thought okay I'll catch a great wave in and make it look really good caught a fantastic ray wave in off Crescent Head Point all the way through to the beach and paddle in I thought great they hopefully they got that they didn't get it they hadn't been shooting they were just sitting there waiting and when I got in there they wouldn't do an interview and then send me back out again the last thing you want to do after day number six I think it was and spending so much time on the water but that's how we raise money and that's that's the way we had to do it Days 8 and 9 were a horrendous 115k battle as the weather turns nasty on the journey to Coffs Harbour via Nambucca Heads. Did another fundraiser at Crescent Head and then I paddled from Crescent Head down to Nambucca. Things were turning ugly by this stage. Um, We'd been told that there was a cyclone building the day before and by the time I got to Nambucca, it had built. It was starting to rain, the wind was starting to come in. It wasn't a fun day. And the next day, the cyclone had hit. I managed to get a bit of paddling in. And then I can remember running the last 10 kilometres into Coffs Harbour on the road. You, you couldn't even get on the beach. The cyclone had hit. It was just ugly. And that's where I finished. I think I was day 10 and I was due for a day off. 
little did I know the next day was going to be probably one of the most horrific for me paddling, but the most beautiful. And I had no idea what was ahead. We leave Craig as he licks his wounds and recovers on his only scheduled rest day. He still has six more days to go and over 325 kilometres of open water paddling ahead. Back in Sydney, Jessica had completed her final round of cancer treatment. Craig was missing her and his family and at times questioned why he has spent nine exhausting days away from them. But this was his way of supporting Jessica. He was a doer. He needed to do something tangible to contribute. Join us for episode 10 as his marathon reaches a climax. He is reunited with his family and Craig returns to Project Gymea as they begin their next undercover criminal surveillance. Conviction, the Craig Guse story, is a podcast based on Craig's personal recollections. It is not a full and complete representation of the cases, the people or the investigations, and therefore should not be taken as such. This podcast is based on Craig's memories. Craig and Three Ring Circus have taken care not to disclose surveillance methods that would compromise police procedures. Only real names have been used where we have permission or the records are public domain.